Today's reading is from Exodus 16, 23 to 26. He, Moses, said to them, This is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil, and all that is left over lay aside to be kept till the morning. So they laid it aside till the morning, as Moses commanded them, and it did not stink, and there were no worms in it. Moses said, Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, there will be none. Exodus 23, 6-13 you shall not pervert the justice due to your poor in, the, in his lawsuit. Keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not acquit the wicked. And you shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the clear-sighted and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. You shall not oppress a sojourner. You know the heart of a sojourner, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. For six years you shall sow your land and gather in its yield, but the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, for the poor of your people, that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave the beasts of the field may eat. You shall do likewise with your vineyard and with your olive orchard. Six days you shall do your work, but on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey may have rest, and the son of your servant woman and the alien may be refreshed. Pay attention to all that I have said to you, and make no mention of the names of other gods, nor let it be heard on your lips. Thank you, Suai. Good morning, all. It's a beautiful Sunday morning out there, and uh, hope you had a good weekend. We are uh, continuing on in our sermon series this morning, All Things New, the Story of the Bible and the Healing of the World, before we jump in uh, to our sermon today, I want to just uh, really quick say that we're gonna, I'm going to be giving a family chat next week with some updates about what we're uh, doing as a congregation. The elders met last Tuesday. We kind of talked through a uh, tentative plan. I know the president uh, has said some things this week. I don't anticipate that anything that the elders uh, have decided is going to change uh, in light of what the president has said. So uh, don't uh, come with big expectations next week. I think uh, we're just going to continue to follow the state's recommendation. But I'll have more information uh, next week uh, as we get started um, uh, uh, in the service. So any case, today we are continuing on in our sermon series, and since January, we have been working our way through the overarching story of the Bible. The Bible tells a continuous story, so if you're just joining in uh, on uh, the, the stream and uh, you're new to, the, to, to Calvary, uh, just know that since January, we've been following the overall storyline of the Bible. The Bible tells a, a single story, and we focused uh, in the first number of weeks on kind of the age of the beginnings, and then we moved to the age of the patriarchs, and now we're in the age of the law, and the law being the commands and the regulations that God gave to the people of Israel that was to govern uh, their interactions with each other and with Him throughout their history. So all throughout this sermon series, we've been tracing the theme of God's healing of the world. God made the world good and beautiful. He gave it as a great gift to humanity. And then humanity, very early on in the story, Genesis chapter 3, tragically fell away from God and things went poorly. And ever since, God has been patiently and faithfully uh, restoring the world, working to restore the world, not only back to its original goodness that we saw in the creation account in Genesis 1 and 2, but to bring all of creation to a place of maturity that God had intended all along. So God had made the world with a view to it growing to a place of maturity, and before it could grow to maturity, it fell into sin. And so God is healing the world, bringing it back to its original goodness so that it can continue on in its growth into maturity. So we've been looking this past weeks at how the law was a precursor, a sign of the redemption that God ultimately was going to bring through Jesus. We've looked at the law's emphasis on love, 
Uh, Pastor Eric helped us see that. The law's emphasis on blood sacrifices, the law's account of the tabernacle or the dwelling place where God was worshipped. Today we're going to look at another important aspect of the law, probably one of the most important aspects of the law, the law's concept of Sabbath rest. We've talked about the Sabbath before. If you were around, I believe it was last year, maybe about this time, we were going through uh, the book of Hebrews, and in the book of Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, uh, the author draws particular attention to the Sabbath rest. And so we're, we're going to cover some familiar territory if you've been around and, and paid attention in any uh, way to the sermons that we had last year on Hebrews. But um, we're going to look at a little bit of a new angle uh, this time. And so we're going to see uh, the law's teaching on Sabbath rest, but also how the Sabbath rest facilitates and enables us to love others. So we're going to draw this connection between resting in God and loving others. So do you want to love others better this morning? Maybe this is something that's kind of been on uh, your mind or your heart lately. You look at your relationships and you're like, oh, I should be better at loving people. And I'm just not. And I think probably all of us feel that way, right? I mean, whether we're religious or not religious, all of us have some sense that we should be better at loving people than we do. We want to be better at loving others, but then we just don't follow through on it in all the ways we want to. So why is it that we want to love others better, but we can't quite seem to get there? And what does the Sabbath given to the Israelites so many, many years ago have to teach us about what it means to love others better and how we can love others better. Well, our scriptures today, which have been read for us, are from Exodus 16 and Exodus 23, uh, both accounts or information about the Sabbath. We're going to take a lesson from each passage or find a lesson in each passage. The lesson from 16 is going to provide the backdrop for the lesson in Exodus 23. And chapter 23 is where we're going to pay particular attention. That's where we're going to uh, see this connection between Sabbath rest and love. So we're going to start with Exodus 16, which is a bit of review from what we did last year, and then we're going to move from there on in to Exodus 23. So the first lesson that we find in Exodus 16 is God supplies. That's the first lesson of the Sabbath, God supplies. For those of you that are perhaps new to the story of the Bible, The Sabbath was a divinely prescribed day of rest to be observed by the Israelites on the seventh day of the week. So the seventh day of the week was Saturday, or is Saturday in the biblical kind of framework. We often think of the, if you think of Sabbath at all, you probably think about it as Sunday. But in the biblical framework, the Uh, The Sabbath rest is the final day of the week. It's the Saturday. And the Israelites were told to cease from work on Saturday, to not work on Saturday. The word Sabbath literally means to cease from work. And the first instance that we find of the Sabbath, the first observance of the Sabbath, as it were, takes place in Exodus chapter 16. Now, this is a passage that just a few weeks ago we spent some time looking at when Jesus was talking about bread from heaven. This is also where God gives bread from heaven. So we have kind of two major ideas that are here in Exodus 16. The stories are kind of woven together. But as you might recall, the Israelites come up out of the land of Egypt. They're on their way to the promised land. They're in the wilderness, and they're they're out of food. They have no food. And so God provides manna. He provides bread from heaven And each day this bread would come down and would appear on the ground with the dew in the morning. And the Israelites would go out each day and they would collect all the the manna or the bread from heaven. And that would be the food that they had for the day to get through the day. And so each day enough manna came down for that day. There was the daily bread. It was the provision for that day. And so the Israelites would go out and collect it each day, except the day before the Sabbath. When the bread came down and God was providing, also the rule of the Sabbath came down. They were to go out and to gather the bread every day for that day, except on the day before the Sabbath, because on the Sabbath day, no bread would come. God would not provide any bread on the Sabbath. They were to rest on the Sabbath. The bread that would come down would come on the sixth day. So on the, on the sixth day before the Sabbath, they were to go and collect twice as much get twice as much bread because on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there was going to be no bread. And so you could live off 
of the, uh, the, the double portion from the sixth day on the sixth day and the seventh day. So it was six days on and one days off for the provision that God was going to bring. And then ultimately on the, on the seventh day, they were to rest. They were not to go out and try to provide for themselves on the seventh day. Now, ultimately, this Sabbath observance was an act of faith. Because every Sabbath, when the manna didn't come, there would have been a temptation for the Israelites to turn to some other source of provision to provide for themselves. I mean, they needed bread. They, they didn't have, you know, refrigerators where they were keeping all of their food and they could just run to the fridge, right? So like they needed daily bread. And when the bread didn't come on a Sabbath, they, they might have crossed their minds or might have run through their minds like, well, what if that was, what if yesterday was the last day? right? I need to provide for myself. I need to provide our own uh, food for our family. So every Sabbath, it was an opportunity for the Israelites to embody their trust in God's promise that He would provide their daily bread and that He would bring the bread back on the first day. So each Sabbath was kind of like a trust fall, right? Each time the Israelites didn't work, they didn't try to provide for themselves on the Sabbath and instead trusted into the promise of God and His provision, promise of provision, their faith in God's capacity and willingness to provide increased. That's what a trust fall does, right? If you've ever done a trust fall, you don't, that, that first fall back, it's very nervous, right? But if you do it enough times and you grow in confidence of the capacity and the willingness of the people to catch you, then your, your, uh, your, your faith in them increases. So the Sabbath was like a weekly trust fall to not go out and provide for themselves and to believe that God would continue faithfully in his promise to provide. Now, this idea of Sabbath rest is very different than how many of us tend to think about rest. For most of us, our idea of resting or ceasing from work has more to do with the concept of recharging our batteries. We rest so that we can regather our strength and get back to work. Now, there's truth in that, and I'm not even dismissing that as a concept, but that's not the idea that was going on with the Sabbath. In the concept of resting to recharge your batteries, resting is still fundamentally about working. The logic goes something like this. If you don't rest properly, you will eventually burn out. And if you burn out, you can't work. And if you can't work, you can't provide for yourself. So you have to rest in order to provide for yourself. And that's how most of us think about weekends. We come into the weekend to rest, to regather our strength so that we can get back to providing for ourselves on Monday. But that's actually the exact opposite idea of what the Sabbath was all about. The Israelites were told to cease working for a day, not primarily so they could rest and recharge their self-sufficiency batteries, they were told to cease working for a day in order to remind them that God was the one who supplied their every need and that his work was sufficient for their needs. Thus, the Sabbath wasn't primarily a day of R&R. And it wasn't even primarily a day of worship in the terms of the way that we think about Sunday set aside as a time for worship. That wasn't how the Israelites arranged their weeks. As important as rest and recreation are, and that is important, and as weekly worship is, and that's also important, that wasn't what the Sabbath was about. The Sabbath was a weekly tangible reminder to the Israelites that their provision came from God, not from themselves. That ultimately, God was the one who supplied their needs. They didn't supply their own needs. It was a reminder that God was their supplier. Okay, so the first lesson of the Sabbath is God supplies, in contrast to you supply for yourself. God supplies. All right, so that's the backdrop in Exodus 16 that we see as we approach this idea of Sabbath. God is the one who supplies. So let's turn now to Exodus 23. Uh, we're looking here at verses uh, 6 through uh, 14, or 6 through uh, 13. 6 through 12. You really, you can go to 6. I mean, this is all inspired. So you can use 6, 13 to 14 too. But the point is we're going we're gonna to focus on verse 12. All right. So God supplies first lesson. Second lesson, God supplies 
so we can love. God supplies so we can love. It's the second lesson. A major theme in the law, as Pastor Eric noted a few weeks ago, is the concept of love. The Ten Commandments embody this ideal, right? The first, uh, the first table commandments, as it were, are about us loving God. The second table commandments are about us loving our, our, uh, our neighbor as ourselves, right? And so love is the embodiment, the fulfillment of the law. Exodus 16 is really connecting this idea of Sabbath rest, weekly Sabbath rest, with this ideal of love, particularly love for the other. Exodus, uh, Exodus uh, 23, rather. So Exodus 16 is giving us a picture of the first Sabbath observance. Exodus 23 is a passage where we're given instruction about the logic of the Sabbath or the kind of the rationale of the Sabbath. So in verses 6 through 11, which were read for us, we see a theme of social justice. And we can put that in our vernacular today, right? You're to not pervert justice that is due to the poor. That's in verse 6. Keep away from false charges. Don't kill the innocent and the righteous. Uh, take no bribe, verse 8. For a bribe blinds the clear-sighted and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. And then verse 9, you shall not oppress a sojourner. So a sojourner would have been uh, like we think of like as aliens or immigrants. So those that were not of the tribes of Israel but were living amongst the Israelites would have been a sojourner. And it would have been a temptation perhaps to oppress those who were seemed less or outside the tribe. But they're not to oppress a sojourner, they're told. They said, you were a sojourner in the land of Egypt, right? And it, you didn't like being oppressed then. So don't oppress others that are in your land now. <clears throat> and then we have the law of planting in verses 10 and 11, this idea of six days on, one day off, then is uh, replicated in the sowing and the harvest, right? So it's six years on, one year off, and it's the same logic as the Sabbath, right? You, you work for six years, but you take that seventh year off, and in that seventh year, you're reminded about how God is the one that supplies. As it happens, if you know the remainder of Israel's history, is that Israel never followed the six years on, one year off rule. And they ended up in captivity over it. So for every year that they should have taken off, that they didn't take off, they ended up in captivity. So 70 years uh, they ended up in captivity. But that is down the road. So we'll get to that in the coming uh, months. So, but then we get in that context of kind of caring for, or I should say also in the... Uh, the six years on, one year off, that one year off is set in the context of making sure that the poor can eat, right? So the, the, the poor then are able to eat from the fields uh, as they self-produce in those times. Okay, so then we get to the Sabbath here in verse 12. Listen to what it says here. Six days you shall do your work, but on the seventh day you shall rest that your ox and your donkey may have rest and the son of your servant woman and the alien may be refreshed. The seventh day was to be a Sabbath rest so that the workers of one's field could rest and be refreshed. Now just a moment ago under the first lesson, I said that the law's concept of Sabbath rest was not about recreation and refreshment, but that wasn't quite the whole story we're seeing here because there does seem to be a refreshment component to the Sabbath. But notably, the Sabbath's rest and refreshment was for the sake of the oxen and the donkey and the servants and the aliens that worked for you. Right? So in other words, the rest or the recreation of the Sabbath was not for the landowner, but for those who worked for the landowner. If the landowner did not cease working, then those who worked for him, those who worked under him, would get no rest. So if I, as an Israelite landowner, neglected to live in dependence upon God, I, I, I didn't live with an attitude of dependence upon God, so I didn't take my Sabbath rest. Instead, I kept pushing forward without rest day after day after day, striving towards my own self-sufficiency. 
If I have that mindset, then inevitably I forced everyone who worked for me to also keep driving forward. So if I don't rest in the Lord, then no one gets any rest in the Lord that's under me. My refusal as the landowner to rest and depend on God denied rest and refreshment to those who worked for me. All right, so as it relates to rest and refreshment, the point of the Sabbath was not that the landowner needed a day of refreshment each week, but rather that the landowner needed to depend upon the Lord to provide his needs so that those who depended upon the landowner could have a day of rest and refreshment. So the Sabbath was God's way of saying, your ultimate blessing comes from me, not from those who work for you. Rest in me and give your workers a rest. So to give your workers a rest was done in the mindset of God is the one who gives me rest. So because God has given me rest, I can then give my workers a rest. Okay, now let's take this Sabbath principle and translate it into a general principle for our contemporary context. So the Sabbath was Saturday. I don't think any of us probably at Calvary are observing Sabbath in a technical sense on a Saturday where we don't do any work, right? So what is this principle? How does it apply into our lives today? And here's the principle that I would extend to us and have us uh, consider. When I don't depend on the Lord to meet my needs, when I don't rest in Him, So God is still supplying needs, right? Even if it's not manna from heaven, God is still the need supplier. When I don't depend on the Lord to meet my needs and rest in Him, this lack of depending on God inevitably forces me to depend on others to meet my needs. And when I depend on others, like I should be depending upon God, I rob them of rest. And when I'm robbing them of rest, I am not loving them. So if I want to love others properly, I need to stop asking them to be what only God can be in my life. In other words, I think here's the message of Exodus 23 as it relates to the Sabbath and social justice and caring for the poor and the oppressed. The key to loving others is to rest in or depend upon God. The key to loving others is to rest in or depend upon God. When I am resting in God, depending on God, then I'm getting what I need from God. And then when I'm getting what I need from God, I am freed up to give to others, to love others. I don't have to, I don't have to lean on them to have my needs met. All right. <clears throat> so to bring this all back to how we started in the beginning of this sermon, you want to love better right? I want to love better. We all want to love better than we do. Who are you not loving well? I take a moment and think about that. In your life, who are you not loving well? Where are you getting stuck when it comes to love? Perhaps the problem, perhaps the problem, this may not answer every issue in that particular relationship that came to your mind, but perhaps the problem is because you are depending on that relationship or those relationships in ways that you should be depending upon God. Perhaps you're depending in an unhealthy way on that relationship in a way that you should be depending upon God. So let me unpack this a little bit. So I see this all the time in uh, marriage counseling. So when I arrive, people come in to my study, they want to sit down and talk through issues related to their marriage. This all the time is probably, this is the number one problem I think that I see as it relates to marriage. Husbands, generally speaking, not always the case, but generally speaking, come to marriage with an expectation of having their need for respect met. And women, generally speaking, not all the time again, but come to marriage with the expectation of having their need for love met. Right? So the husband comes with a need for respect. The wife comes with a need for love. 
But the husband doesn't feel like he's getting the respect that he deserves, and so he doesn't give the love that the wife needs. The wife doesn't feel like she's getting the love that she deserves, so she doesn't give the respect that she needs. And so both of them are coming to the marriage to get something from the marriage, and then when they're not getting what they think they should be getting, they don't give what they have to give to the other person. And so the marriage becomes a marriage of taking, 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 and not giving, giving, giving. But if I come to marriage already filled up with my need for respect met in Christ, or if I come to the marriage already filled up with my need for love met in Christ, then I don't have to come to the marriage to take from the marriage. I can come to the marriage to give to the marriage out of the overflow of what I've already been given in Christ. I have a legitimate need for love and respect. Human beings do, but we have our need for love and respect met in Christ. I think we see this in almost the exact same way in parenting, right? Our children are expressions. If you have kids, right, you know how this works. Our children are expressions of who we are, our sense of identity, our sense of value, our our, our sense of who we are is tied up in them. And we can't bear to see them fail because if they fail, that means in some measure that we fail. And so we push and we drive our kids to be something so that we can feel like we're something. Right? But the same thing is happening there. Right, We're coming to our kids trying to get something from them when we as parents should be giving something to them. And so because we're coming to them with these innate needs that we have for our own sense of dignity and worth and value and self-respect or whatever it is that we're trying to get from our kids through their behavior and through their lifestyle and through their successes and their performances, whatever, we're not actually giving to them, we're taking from them. And so much of you, if you've grown up as a child in a home where this was going on, you know that that doesn't feel right. Even if you haven't been able to articulate it, you just know it doesn't feel right. Like, no one wants to feel needed by their parents, especially when they're young children uh, living in the home. But if my identity as a parent is firmed up in who I am in Jesus, and my sense of value, my sense of dignity, my sense of respect, my sense of worth is firmed up in who I am as a Christian in Jesus and what God has provided, then I don't have to come to my children to get that, right? But I can give out of the bounty of what God has already given to me. This thing happens as well. The same dynamic happens in peer relationships. We come uh, to our peers so often trying to validate our sense of self-worth through the acceptance, the social acceptance of others. And so rather than coming to others to fundamentally give to them and to bless them and to love them, we come to take from them. We want them to to affirm us in in who we think that we should be or or, uh, who we are. But my self-worth as a Christian fundamentally should be rooted not in what others think of me, but in what Christ thinks of me. And if I rest in what God has provided for me in Christ, who I am accepted in Christ, and not what others think of me, then I can move into my relationships to bless and to give, not to take from them. Team members at work, I think this happens the same way, very nearly identical to the way that Exodus lays it out in chapter 23, right? That when we're driven to accomplishment, particularly if we're leading a team, we can drive the team members under us to accomplish because we, our sense of value and self-worth is tied to our accomplishments. And so we're going to press the people under us to help us accomplish. And we won't give them any rest because we aren't taking any rest for ourselves. But our self-worth isn't rooted in our accomplishments, right? Our self-worth is rooted in Christ's accomplishments. And when we rest in Christ's accomplishments, then we don't need to be so driven on ourselves and we don't need to be so driven around the people around us. And we can be freed up to bless and to extend grace. Our deepest and truest needs are ultimately met in God. For as long as we are looking for others to be for us what only God can be, we are going to be stymied in our capacity to love others. We can't give to others when we are fundamentally in need of them. So just linger there for a moment and think about those relationships, perhaps the ones that are closest to home, maybe in the family or work, wherever it might be. Linger there where those relationships are hard and think about what it is that you are trying to get from those relationships. 
And maybe your need to get something from those relationships is what's stymieing your capacity to actually love and to pour in to those relationships. We can't give to others when we are fundamentally in need of them. Now this, I grant you, can be hard to work out in real life. I mean, what does it mean, really, to have God meet our needs? I mean, kind of in theoretical abstract, that sounds right, like have God meet your needs and then you can get, you know, but what does that mean exactly? How do we have God meet our needs? Let me give you three steps for how to embrace the provision of God. Three steps for how to embrace the provision of God so that having embraced the provision of God, I'm freed up now to extend love, right? Because that first move, God supplies, like that's the big move you've got to lay hold of, right? God supplies so that I can love. If we try to move forward with the so that I can love without embracing the God supplies, we're going to be stymied. So I'm going to give us three steps for thinking about how God supplies. I'm going to use uh, kind of the example of marriage as we weave throughout here. Uh, just to kind of give us some uh, hooks on which to hang this. But this would apply equally to parenting, to work, to friendship. So just translate it into whatever situation uh, you're you're, uh, kind of finding yourself stymied by in your efforts to be more loving. All right, so we want to embrace the provision of God. First step, if God is going to meet your needs, we want to see how it is that God provides our needs. The first step, if God is going to meet, meet our needs, is we've got to be honest about our needs. We've just got to be honest about the fact that we have needs. Some of us, not all of us, but some of us are not honest with ourselves about our needs. We just go the Stoic route, right? And if you know anything about the ancient Stoics, the ancient Stoics were masters of detachment. So you go back, and I've spent some time reading the ancient Stoics, like no doubt so many of you also have read about the ancient Stoics. But the ancient Stoics uh, were masters of detachment. And the way to peace and tranquility was by detaching from the world, right? So you just step back. You just disentangled yourself from everything in the world, right? Relationships, wealth, Uh, your body, all of these things. You just disentangle yourself from all of these things and you go into this little little cocoon of safety. One of the old Stoic lines uh, is this, the safest hope of the vanquished is to have none, right? Just give up all hope. If you give up all hope, you can't be disappointed, right? So if you're vanquished, just don't care that you're vanquished. Just give up any hope of rescue and you'll never be disappointed. You can't be disappointed if you don't have hope. You can't be disappointed if you don't love anything. You can't be disappointed and you can't be hurt if you don't have any needs. So the Stoic closes off and pulls into himself or herself, right? And this ancient practice, but I mean, we do our own versions of this today. I am a rock I am an island. I touch no one. No one touches me. Stoicism is only a half measure. It's a shadow version of Christianity. There's a lot of wise things actually in Stoicism. A lot of uh, meditative practices. If you're into meditation at all today or yoga, you're going to find a lot of kind of Stoic teachings. And there's a lot of wisdom in Stoicism about disentangling yourself from things that ultimately can't provide satisfaction. But Stoicism is only a shadow version of Christianity because it undercuts love. Stoicism is right in seeing that we can't find a sure hope in earthly things. It is true. We can't find a sure hope in earthly things. But Stoicism sacrifices love in the interest of emotional safety. So Seneca was one of the major Stoics back in the Roman Empire and uh, he was writing a letter to a friend and was giving some advice about how to deal with his friend whose uh, daughter had died, right? And he says to his friend, crying over the death of a loved one is as silly as crying over the falling leaves of a beautiful tree, All right? There's This is just the way that life goes. And in the same way that you don't grieve over the falling leaves uh, in the autumn, don't grieve over the falling leaves of your daughter's life. She's just going the way that all life goes. Detach yourself from your emotional investment in your daughter, and you won't be so grieved by the fact that she has died. 
It's a loveless and a heartless and cold way of processing our relationships in particular in life. C.S. Lewis, I think, who is much wiser than Seneca, and I like Seneca, but you know, C.S. Lewis, much wiser, he writes this in his book, The Four Loves. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable to love is to be vulnerable. There's no way to get through life without being vulnerable and loving at the same time. To love is to be vulnerable. You can't love others if you cut yourself off emotionally from them, if you cut yourself off from your sense of need, right? If you deny the fact that you have needs, you're going to deny your capacity to love. So don't be a stoic. That's the first lesson I would give you, right? The first step. Don't be a stoic. If you want to know how God provides for your needs, then you have to be in touch with your needs. So the first step is to be honest about your needs. Second step, understand the difference between surface needs and core needs, all right? Surface needs and core needs. Here's an example that I use uh, all the time when people come to me for counseling, and I contemplated whether I should use it because I really like using this example in my counseling, and now I'm going to give it away free of charge to the entire congregation. And if you come to me for counseling, I won't have this in my hip pocket anymore because I'll have already spent it. But in love, I'm giving it all to you here. So here's this example, right? You're driving down 290. You're in the left-hand lane. You're doing 75. It's respectable. You know, a little bit of speeding, but not, nothing you're going to get arrested over, right? And a guy comes flying up behind you, right on your bumper, flashes the lights, gives you the uh, one-fingered salute, pulls around uh, next to you, yells out his window, peels in front of you, then pulls in front of you, hits the brakes just to teach you a lesson. You have to stop quick so you don't bump into him, and then he speeds off. All right, now, most of us would not enjoy that experience. To varying degrees, we would be bothered by that, right? Now, unless you're the Stoic. If you're the Stoic back here in first step, you haven't moved beyond step number one. Maybe you're not bothered at all because you're a rock, you're an island, no one touches you, you don't touch anybody. But for most of us, we're not Stoic enough to not be bothered by that. So we're all going to be bothered by that to some degree. And so whenever I'm talking with someone in a counseling situation, I'll say, now, why would that bother you? And here are the two reasons that most often emerge when people say why it would bother them. One set of reasons would be something around like that was unsafe. Like there was danger there, right? I, it could have damaged my car, could have damaged me physically. Like that was a scary, like a physically scary situation. That's one. Second uh, cluster of reasons are I was insulted. Like that was offensive. Like who does that person think this? is? I was driving just fine and they insulted me and offended me. Right? And those are two different reasons for that same event. Right? So here's this, here's this uh, threat up here, right? this guy driving erratically around you. Right? But it provokes two different senses of threat. Right? And one threat is related to physical safety. One is related more to your psychological safety or your self-respect. Right? And we can see this just in the way that it works out in uh, road incidents, right? because when you have these sorts of things, you'll have the crazy person that he cuts the one guy off. So this guy gets, says, you've just stolen my self-respect. So I'm going to get in front of you and cut you off to get my self-respect back. And now you've stolen his self-respect and he gets offended. And then it's back and forth, back and forth. And they finally pull over on the side of the road, like a mile and a half down, get crowbars out and they beat each other to death. Right. And clearly they're not concerned about physical safety. That wasn't what that was about. Right. But some of us, when that happens, we just get as far away from that car as we can, right? Because that's the main thing. It's the physical safety. So the same event, but it's impacting us at a different way, at a different, what I'm going to suggest, is a different core need. Right? I think there are five core needs, love, respect, physical safety, purpose, 
and hope. But I'm not going to try to go into all of these here right now. But I think there are core needs that get down to like the base things of what it means to be a human being, right? We need love. We need respect. We need physical safety. We need purpose. We need hope. We cannot navigate life without those things. And as one of those things gets threatened, we're going to feel it. Right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to provoke in us some sort of anxiety or response or a, or a threat. Right? So these core needs then operate at the deeper level. Right? There's the kind of this surface level of like say a traffic incident. But though all of us would be bothered by this traffic incident, we're not all bothered at the same core need level. Right? There's something that's deeper. Right? So all of us might have this uh, frustration at our kids disrespecting us, or perhaps my wife nagging me, or my husband uh, overworking, right? We have, these, uh, we have these things that are happening, right? But we haven't maybe yet done the work of figuring out what the core need is that is being threatened. And we need to keep peeling back the layers of the onion until we get to a core need. So when something bad happens that you feel some measure of anxiety or frustration or fear or anger about, ask yourself, particularly if it's a it's a it's a ongoing thing that just keeps happening, right? Ask yourself, why does that bother me? And then after you answer that question, say, well, why does that bother me? And then keep asking yourself, well, why does that bother me? And keep going down until you get to one of the core needs. I was doing counseling uh, with a woman who was having some difficulties in her marriage, and she was talking about the possibility of her marriage ending. And I said, well, why, like, what causes you anxiety about your marriage ending? You know, anyone's ending, marriage ending obviously causes anxiety. That's a universal uh, situation. But what is it about your marriage ending that's causing you anxiety? And as we peeled back the layers of the onion, what it came down to was that if her husband left her, she had no source of income, no capacity for a job, and she was genuinely worried she might end up on the street or homeless. Now, I was talking with another lady, and she had the same situation. She thought her marriage might end. And again, I asked her, like, what is it about your marriage ending that causes you anxiety? Well, if my marriage ends, then that means my husband doesn't love me. Well, yes, but what about your husband not loving causes you anxiety? Well, if my husband doesn't love me, then, then and we peeled it all the way back down to, then maybe I'm not loved, right? And so the core need for her wasn't physical safety. She had a job she could provide for herself, but she was worried about missing her core need of love. So you have these surface trials, as it were, but then we have these core needs that are exposed at the bottom. And we need to understand what it is, what our core needs are, distinguish the surface trials from our core, our core trials or our core needs. Sometimes talking with a counselor can be helpful to doing this, right? You, you're well aware of what's bothering you, but you don't know how to peel back the layers of the onion to get down to like what it is about that that's really bothering you at a surface level. So first, be honest about your needs. Second step is understand the difference between like the surface trials and the core needs. And then third, learn how God meets your core needs, right? So this is an important thing point here because God isn't always coming to solve the surface trial, but he is always going to step in at the core need level. It's easy to become convinced. It's relatively easy to become convinced that you can't meet your core needs in a particular earthly thing. So say a marriage. So these two ladies that I was speaking of in their marriages, they had become convinced that they couldn't find their core need met in their marriage, the need for physical safety in one lady's case or the need for love in another lady's case. Sometimes it becomes as like what we've been depending upon, it fails so miserably that it becomes obvious that we can't find our identity or our safety in that. We just can't deny it. But then we get to the point We get to that point and we so often either go one of two routes. When we realize, for instance, that our marriage cannot supply our core need for love, we either go the stoic route, I don't need love. I don't need love. I'm going to go without love, right? And we go back to the stoic route. Or more often, we try to meet that core need in a different earthly way, right? Well, we'll, I'll get a new marriage or I'll, or I'll, I'll get it from my children, 
or I'll get it from work, right? We, we haven't found our core need for love met in our marriage, so we're going to find some other earthly thing that's going to meet our core need for love. Once you've identified the vulnerable core need, don't make the same mistake by trying to meet that core need simply in a different earthly source. You just end up bouncing from one thing to the next, convinced that the next thing will be the real, will be the real thing, but you just keep making the same mistake over and over and over again until you die. St. Augustine once prayed that the heart is restless until it rests in God. Our hearts are restless, he prayed, until, our, until they rest in you. Even the best version of an earthly thing can't meet a core need. If I have a core need for love and I marry to find that core need met and I have the best spouse in the world, at some point, inevitably, that spouse is going to die and I will lose the love that they had given to me. If I try to find my core need met in something of this world, invariably, inevitably, without fail, all things will fail. And when those things fail, whatever I was trusting in them for is gone with them. I preached a sermon um, probably about two years ago now called Created to Need. And the sermon series was eight weeks of unpacking what I've just been talking about for the past 15 or 20 minutes. So if this is resonating with you and you feel like, oh, this is speaking to something in my life and I really need to work this out, go back into uh, our website find the Created to Need sermon series in the sermon archive. And there we look at, uh, I look at each of the needs. Uh, so the need for love, the need for respect, the need for safety, the need for hope, the need for purpose. And uh, go back through that sermon series and look at the needs that are presented there and see which ones may speak to you and help you think through it. But maybe you need to, to sit and talk to a counselor or you need to talk to one of the pastors. I mean, read some scripture, pray. Talk to someone who embodies the very thing that you are looking to receive from God. You want to feel your core need for love met in God? Then find someone who basks in the love of God. You want to find someone, you want to find your core need for respect met in God? Then find someone who feels honored and, and uh, esteemed as a child of God and, and learn from them. Ask them to teach you. And then as you learn to find your core need met in God, then give to others out of the bounty of what God has given to you. There aren't any silver bullets. There's no easy answers to this. I'm not pretending that in the past 15 minutes I uh, have solved all of your problems. I know that's uh, not the case. But fundamentally, we need to get to a, a posture of giving to others, not taking from others. If we approach the world, and particularly we approach people with our neediness, we're going to have to take from them. And as long as we're taking from them, we're not loving them and we can't give to them. So be filled up with all of your needs met, your core needs met in God. And then out of that, then give to uh, those around you. Well, it would be amiss to wrap up today's sermon without connecting the Sabbath rest of the law to the Sabbath rest that Jesus gives us. Hebrews 4 develops this idea. In Hebrews 4, the author says that, that uh, the Old Testament uh, prophets had uh, prefigured the rest, had spoken of the rest, but they didn't actually give the true rest. It was Jesus who gives the true rest because Jesus is the one who provides ultimately for our deepest, most basic needs. Through Jesus, through faith in Jesus, we enter into God's Sabbath rest. This Old Testament Sabbath rest pointed forward to the true and full Sabbath rest of Christ. Not just a single day of rest once a week, but an entire existence of rest, a lifetime of rest, a lifetime of resting in the provision of God and resting in that provision of God, being freed up to give to others. This is what humanity was created for. Go back to what we started the sermon series. Humanity is created as the priest kings and kings of the kings and queens of the world 
to be filled up with the life of God and then extend that life out into creation. This is what it means to be the priests, kings, and kings of the world. And we, in Christ, are being, being brought back into that identity to be filled up in who we are in God, to have our core needs met in God, and then out of that filling, then to extend the life of God, the love of God out into the world, into our relationships. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of God's promises. He is God's provision for respect, for love, for our need for purpose, our need for hope, our need for physical safety, ultimately in the resurrection of the body. He is the embodiment of God's bounty, and he is the object of our trust. So if you're a Christian this morning, let me encourage you, closing, to live by faith in the already now righteousness of this rest, this cosmic universal rest that God is bringing through Christ fully to the world on the last day. God is going to bring this rest fully back into the world. And we will bathe in it like we bathe in the sea. And we can even now through faith begin to enter in to this rest. God knows your deepest core needs. He is watching over you. He cares for you. Rest in the comfort of Christ's Sabbath rest. And then from there, in that position of receiving, then be a blessing to others. Extend that love to others. If you're not a Christian this morning, now is the time to quit depending upon what God has made and instead start depending upon God. What God has made independent of God, can never supply our core needs, our need for love and hope and safety and purpose and respect. We can't get these met through what God has made. They come only from God. He is the one that supplies the core needs of our lives. You can't bless the world if you are depending upon the world to meet your deepest needs. You cannot bless those around you if you are depending upon them to meet your deepest needs. You need to get your needs met from God through Jesus Christ. And then out of the bounty that comes in the love of God being poured into your life, you can then extend that love and that life to others. Find your hope and your sustenance in God through Christ. And then from there, be a blessing out into the world. Jesus says, I am the truth, I am the way, I am the life. He is the one that extends the life of God freely back into humanity. We cannot earn it. We can't merit it. We can't be good enough to to receive it. We just come to him in faith and we ask for it as those who recognize our need. And God, through Christ, puts death to death on the cross and then in raising Jesus up, to new life. He brings life back into the world. And that death to death and that life to life can be yours freely through faith in Jesus Christ. If we confess Jesus as Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 9, then we can be saved. And so let me encourage you to not cling to the things that God has made to try to find your hope and salvation, but to cling to the God who made those things and find in that God through Jesus Christ all the freedom and the hope and the love and the peace and the joy that you're looking for. And from there, extend it out and be a blessing. Let me pray for us and uh, pray that God would, this week in particular, cause us uh, to bask in the Sabbath rest, the eternal Sabbath rest that Christ has provided for us. Father, thank you that we have Christ, that he is the true rest. Uh, So easy it is for us, Lord, to try to find our rest in the things that you have made. And um, God, what beautiful good things you have made as an extension of your own goodness and how you do even meet our needs through those things, but, but not independent of you, not isolated from you, Lord. You are the fount of all goodness. You are the source of life. You are 
hope, you are purpose, you are respect, you are love, you are safety, you are everything that we need. God, help us to find all that we need in you. And then having found what we need in you, God, give us the capacity to extend that love to others. God, we pray uh, that you would make this true in our lives this week. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.